Right. So, uh, Nima, I'll be I'll be chatting today. You let me know when um, when you so you decide when when to take the break, right? Oh. Just to decide. Uh, are you ready? Can, can we? Yeah, can we start? absolutely. Okay, yeah. great. So let's start with the second lecture by Nima Kanya Hamed, please. All right, guys. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so let's. Um, uh, uh, last time we left things off by going back um, uh, to a very basic question. Um, what is a particle? Remember, uh, my, my goal here in these uh, first couple of lectures is to give you uh, a, a way of thinking about um, uh, what, uh, what particle physics is, uh, really going back to even what a particle is, uh, from this uh, point of view that uh, emphasizes the dramatic difference between massive and massless uh, particles, and is also associated more generally with the way of uh, thinking about things where the, the properties, the invariant properties of the particles themselves are the sort of the star of the show, um, rather than the sort of somewhat more conventional textbook point of view where we talk about quantum fields and so on first and sort of particles come out later as some excitation of the quantum field. Um, the point of view uh, that I'm uh, exposing here is one where it's really the sort of particles of the fundamental objects uh, from the from the get go. Um, and uh, so uh, the things that we'll be talking about uh, today are really going back to this very basic question, uh, what is a particle? Um, and the, the uh, deep uh, distinction that we talked about already between uh, massive versus massless. Um, and uh, I will begin to talk about why the case of massless particles, especially, are, are incredibly constrained, okay? Um, they're incredibly constrained uh, by uh, both the Poincaré invariants, so by the space-time symmetries, which uh, goes in, again, to uh, uh, even what we mean by what a particle is, that's what we're gonna uh, start with. Um, and uh, unitarity and uh, 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 quantum mechanics. And uh, the, the amazing fact that I alluded to last time is that really these two things uh, in a very direct way, in a very direct way, these are the principles of space time and quantum mechanics um, tell us that we have this minuscule menu um, that we're allowed to choose from in order to describe any possible universe compatible with the principles of uh, quantum mechanics and uh, uh, even special relativity, um, that the structure of the spin one must be Yang Mills, that the structure of the spin two must be GR, that the spin three half must be associated with SUSY. Um, and uh, so uh, now these are all things that of course are are uh, standardly discovered um, uh, from a more conventional uh, point of view of quantum field theory as well, um, but in a more roundabout way, at least from my point of view in a more uh, roundabout way. Um, I, I wanna describe things this way because I find them very vivid. You see very clearly how directly the principles of uh, space time and quantum mechanics are reflected in the possible theories that can uh, uh, describe nature. And all of this will give you a deeper appreciation for what is special about spin zero. Okay, so uh, so spin zero is the story of the Higgs spin zero. Um, it's the as I mentioned last time, the Higgs is the first spin zero elementary particle that we've ever seen. And at, I believe after this discussion, you'll have a, a, a better appreciation for what is really so uh, special about. It. Okay, so um, okay, and then. Uh, 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 after this discussion, we'll move on to say more things about the Higgs uh, uh, specifically, but today will mostly be about um, uh, about uh, uh, talking in more detail, even though we understand it intuitively quite well, of talking in more detail about the difference between uh, massive and massless um, and uh, going through aspects of this argument for why the dynamics of massless particles, especially with higher spin, is so ridiculously uh, constrained. Um, I think this story that I'm telling you is one of the really great stories of uh, theoretical physics um, and gives you a sense for uh, why it is that relativity and quantum mechanics put such an insanely tight straitjacket on our, on our imaginations for what might uh, actually uh, be happening uh, as, we, as we understand uh, nature more, more and more deeply. 
blockchain. So, all right, so, so let's go back to this question, um, what is a particle? Uh, and uh, I, as I emphasized uh, last time, the sort of more abstract answer to this question that's of course very closely connected to the intuitive way of thinking about it is it's the uh, particles are irreducible uh, representations of the Poincaré group. And uh, uh, we diagonalize translations by working with momentum eigenstates. And so we have states that are labeled by uh, a momentum P mu, which satisfies the on shell constraint that P squared equals M squared. But the states are labeled by P mu uh, and some other label sigma, okay? And all of our discussion to begin with is gonna talk about what these other labels sigma can possibly be. As I mentioned before, this is really following Wigner um, and the notation and the argument of, uh, that you can find in Weinberg uh, volume one. Okay. All right, so these are the states, but what we're interested in figuring out is how can we possibly, uh, if we take a general Lorentz transformation, um, uh, uh, lambda goes, uh, uh, P goes to lambda, let me just write it explicitly once. If we take a general Lorentz transformation, um, lambda mu nu, so that we have, uh, uh, P mu goes to lambda mu nu P nu. So I'll, I'll, uh, I will uh, abbreviate this often just as P goes to lambda P. Well, we want to find a unitary operator U of lambda associated with that Lorentz transformation. And we want to see how does U of lambda act on these uh, uh, momentum eigenstates. And the most, uh, the, the most naive answer would be that U of lambda um, U of lambda acts on P sigma to give lambda P sigma, where these sigma labels are the same. So we can ask, is this the answer? And this is not the most general answer. Okay? And it's obvious that it can't be the most general answer because as we discussed, um, there are certain Lorentz transformations P uh, that leave, so take those Lorentz transformations uh, uh, lambda such that lambda P equals P. So take these special Lorentz transformations uh, such that lambda star P equals P. For example, if the, if the particle is just at rest so that P is equal to uh, M zero, then, then these lambdas would just be rotations, okay? So just to take a very simple example for a massive particle at rest, clearly there are Lorentz transformations that leave the momentum invariant, but they have to rotate something else. We know that the particles have spin, so they have to rotate uh, something else. They have to rotate the uh, spin index, okay? So this formula cannot be correct, uh, uh, at least intuitively, we know it cannot be correct because, uh, because uh, there has to be something that reflects um, the action of rotations that don't, of the Lorentz transformations that leave the momentum invariant, but which somehow mixed up the spin labels. Here we're cheating a little bit because we're jumping to the end that we happen to know that massive particles have spin. Uh, and so we know there has to be something missing, um, but uh, uh, we're now going to discover that spin is one of the quantum numbers that can label uh, a space time quantum number that labels uh, massive particles. And that analogously, it will only be helicity that, la that labels the um, uh, quantum numbers for massive particles. Okay, so in order to do this, uh, we have to be careful about how we actually label all of the states. So this was really sort of uh, uh, Wigner's idea. Let's begin by carefully labeling all the states and defining all the states. Begin by defining what we mean by all these states. Defining all the states um, P sigma. And uh, Wigner's idea was to begin with a reference momentum. Okay, so let's say you have a reference momentum uh, K mu. Okay, so for example, for a massive particle, it could be a particle at rest, okay, uh, in some frame. For a massless particle, it could be a particle moving in the z direction, okay? So you begin with a reference momentum, and then you find some way of writing your general momentum, P mu, as a particular Lorentz transformation on that reference momentum, okay? And notice that this choice we're making for the Lorentz transformations, I'm gonna write P mu with some Lorentz transformation, L mu nu, 
that depends on P, it will depend on this reference momentum K times K nu, okay? Um, and uh, here I'm making a choice, okay? This guy is not unique. And again, we've seen why it isn't unique because once you make some choice to make the Lorentz transformation to take you from K to P, you can still do more Lorentz transformations that leave P invariant, all right? So, so this choice is not unique, but pick one, okay? You pick any way you like, a particular way of, uh, of uh, writing the general momentum P mu as a Lorentz transformation on, on K. Um, and now what we're going to do is, this is going to be a definition now. We're gonna define P and sigma is defined as this unitary transformation now um, uh, for, for this special Lorentz transformation L of P and K on K and sigma. And notice this is a definition. The important part of this formula is that the sigmas on these two sides are exactly the same, okay? Okay, so, um, so uh, in other words, I, I have to tell you how I'm um, comparing what I mean by these new labels of the particles for one momentum and another momentum. And I'm simply defining that label uh, for the for a general momentum to be what I would get from the reference momentum by doing this specific Lorentz transformation um, that took me from one guy to the other. Okay, so this is a this is a, a definition for what I mean by all the states. Once you make a choice for the reference momentum and a choice for the, the special Lorentz transformation, this is now uh, this is now a definition um, for the general state. With that definition now, now we can ask what happens when I take u of lambda and I act it on this uh, state P and sigma, okay? And uh, so, okay, so, uh, so what is this? This is U of lambda um, and uh, uh, just the definition that I just gave you for P and sigma, okay? And uh, our previous naive um, uh, feeling for what the answer uh, would have been as U of L, of lambda p and k on k and sigma. That was our sort of naive idea because uh, if we did that, uh, this would have been uh, lambda p and sigma, right? With the same sigma. But obviously this is not true, okay? The, um, uh, the closest we can make it to be true um, is to, Go back here and just uh, shove in front of this expression one. Okay, um, I will write this as uh, u of l of lambda p times the inverse of this guy, l inverse of lambda p. Okay, so this is now u of l of lambda p and k times u of uh, this uh, uh, composite object, L inverse lambda K, lambda L. And uh, I, I should have said explicitly, of course, uh, a, a very important property of these unitary transformations is that they should faithfully represent the Lorentz transformation so that U of lambda one, U of lambda two is U of lambda one, lambda two. Okay, now uh, let's look at this uh, uh, expression. I'm gonna define this guy to be a, 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 a Lorentz transformation, W that stands for Wigner, W that depends on lambda, P, and of course this uh, reference K. But what's the important part of W? What does W do to K? Okay, what does W do to K? W takes K to LP of K is P to lambda P, that's after acting with lambda, and then L inverse of lambda P brings us back to K, right? So, so um, what that tells us is that this U of W, I'll call it from now on, on K and sigma, Whatever it is on the right-hand side, it has the same sigma. It has the same k because wk is equal to k. And therefore, this is something of the form, the sum sum over sigma prime, d sigma sigma prime of w 
on K and sigma prime. Okay, so that's all I know about uh, this guy. All right, some linear combination, but with the same K of K and sigma prime. And therefore, if I slap on this U on the outside, uh, what I finally get is that uh, is uh, that U of lambda on P sigma is the sum over sigma prime of this D sigma sigma prime of W. Um, uh, since the K is the, the uh, since I got K back here now, when U of lambda uh, P acts on the K, it's just gonna give me lambda P, okay? So times uh, lambda P and sigma prime. Right, that's the final expression that we want. So we have learned how uh, we have learned how to represent the action of a general Lorentz transformation on our state. Okay, and as as uh, as as said, this Lorentz transformation now mixes up the other labels, whatever these other labels are. Okay, so we've learned the rule by which they mix them up, but we also learned what the other labels are. The other labels are a representation of uh, of the so-called little group, okay? So what is the the uh, uh, of the uh, little group? The little group is the uh, set of all Lorentz transformations, all Lorentz transformations um, W such that uh, W mu nu K nu is equal to K mu, okay? And that's again, what we expected intuitively to begin with, that uh, for example, if we have the massive particle, if we do the Lorentz transformation on it, it should mix up something. It should uh, we should see the spin, which is associated with the rotations, which are uh, those Lorentz transformations that leave the massive particle at rest invariant. And now we've we've seen this in a slightly more formal way. Um, what these labels d sigma sigma prime are, they have to be a representation of the little group. Okay, they're a representation of those Lorentz transformations w that leave k. Uh, invariant. Okay, so what we've learned is that the sigma labels um, are uh, a representation of this little group. All right, any questions about this uh, so far? Okay. If not, let's uh, uh, proceed. So um, now, so now let's 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 look at this question of massive versus massless. Okay, and um, so uh, so first, let's look at uh, the case of massive, and we have to figure out what the little group is. So so let's let's choose for our reference momentum the most obvious choice, m zero. Okay. And therefore, the little group are just rotations, um, is just the rotations. Uh, for in four dimensions, it would be uh, SO3. In D dimensions, it would be SOD minus one. Okay, so that's the, uh, <clears throat> but uh, con con concretely, let's look at an infinitesimal um, Lorentz transformation. An infinitesimal Lorentz transformation is lambda mu nu is just the identity plus something small. Okay, so omega mu nu is a small, uh, uh, it's a small Lorentz transformation. Um, uh, the fact that these uh, Lorentz transformations, uh, lambda mu alpha, lambda nu beta, eta alpha beta uh, has to equal eta mu nu, right? That's the whole point of a Lorentz transformation is that it leaves the metric invariant. Um, this tells me that this omega mu nu, if I lower the indices, is uh, using the metric is anti-symmetric. Okay. Um, and so, if I want to uh, figure out if I have some some lambda k equals k, uh, this means uh, writing out the indices that omega mu nu, let's say with lower indices, k nu has to equal zero. Okay. So, if we want to figure out um, what are the generators of the little group? We have to find those um, uh, Lorentz transformation generators that annihilate uh, the uh, corresponding momentum, all right? And therefore, um, if I now choose uh, k, um, uh, k nu equals m zero, 
what do I learn from this uh, formula? Well, um, uh, if I put uh, mu equals zero, I have that omega zero i k i is equal to zero. Okay, so I don't learn anything from that because the spatial components of k were already zero. Okay, um, but if I put uh, uh, if I put mu equals i, I learn that omega i zero um, uh, m is equal to zero, right? Because the other the other components are zero, so that just tells me that omega i zero is equal to zero. And therefore, since omega is anti-symmetric, I also learn that omega zero i is equal to zero. Okay, so if I look at the matrix of omegas uh, that annihilate k, if I write here zero, one, two, three, it's an anti-symmetric matrix, zero, one, two, three. So uh, I just learned that this that these top components have to be zero, and the rest of it is just an anti-symmetric matrix. And of course, this is what we're familiar with, with rotations, right? So this is just going to be some A, negative A, B, negative B, C, negative C, but it's only non-trivial in this lower block. Uh, and these are rotations. Okay, so that's quite uh, familiar. And so we see that the massive little group um, is uh, uh, just saying it again, is, uh, is SO3, um, uh, or SOD minus one in general, uh, and are just the rotations. Okay, now let's proceed to the massless case where things are going to be different. Sorry, and so if I look at the, uh, uh, what's, the uh, uh, what's the algebra, uh, it's the, uh, what's the algebra, it's, it's the usual one that, that, we, uh, that we know and love where we have um, JX and JY is, uh, is uh, I, J, Z. Um, and, uh, and here, um, uh, sorry, where, where, where these J's uh, are, are uh, implicitly negative I omega. So that, that negative I is just uh, conventional. Um, uh, and uh, if, if I say this more nicely in uh, general dimensions, instead of J, X, uh, I would, uh, replace that with uh, J23, okay? So uh, so the usual, so I could write, for example, JZ and JY is JX. I'm not gonna write the I's because uh, really I'm talking about omegas that don't have the, uh, that don't have the uh, I's, okay? So, so this would be JZ and JX is uh, JY, something like that, okay? So those are the, uh, 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 those are the commutation relations. Uh, and you can just read off these commutation relations uh, even if you didn't know about it, just by taking these matrices, the, the piece that's proportional to A and the B and C are, are three generators and you can just work out what the, what the algebra is, okay? All right, so now let's proceed to the uh, massless case. And now I'm gonna choose uh, K mu to be uh, E, E, zero, zero. Okay, so now this is a this is a, a massless particle, and now let's go through the the uh, the same argument. So I need to have omega mu nu k nu is equal to zero. Okay, so if I put mu equals zero, now already I learned something uh, that omega zero uh, one um, uh, k one plus the rest of zero is equal to zero. So I learned that omega zero one is equal to zero, and therefore omega uh, one zero equals zero. That's actually what I learned by putting mu equals one is that omega one zero uh, K zero plus dot dot equals zero, which already also tells me that omega one zero equals zero. So that's good. Um, and so now finally let's put um, uh, mu equals two. If I put mu equals two, then I learned that omega two zero K zero plus omega two one K one and everything else is zero is equal to zero. And since K zero is equal to K one, this tells me that omega two zero is equal to negative omega two one, okay? And similarly, uh, I learned from mu equals three that omega three zero is equal to negative omega three one, okay? So, uh, so 
uh, if I now look at the omega matrix, given what I've learned, if I write out the same uh, anti-symmetric matrix, okay, so, uh, so I've learned that I have to have zeros. Um, oops, let, let me write this a little bigger, sorry. So I've learned that I have to have zeros here. Um, and so if I put, if I call this uh, um, uh, omega zero two, let me call A and omega zero three, let me call B. Then I learned that, uh, um, uh, then I learned that omega uh, two, I learned that omega two zero is equal to uh, negative omega two one. Okay, so that means that uh, if I put a, by anti-symmetry, this would be a negative A here and a negative B. So here, this is A and B, okay? And similarly here, I get negative A and negative B. And then I, I, I know nothing about the omega two, three, so there's just a C there, okay? All right, so notice that once again, there are three generators, three independent generators that annihilate uh, the light-like momentum, but they look different. They look different than the ones that we had before, okay? Um, so obviously the number of symmetries doesn't jump. So there's three generators for rotation, but when it's massless, we have these uh, new three uh, generators. And so let me define, um, uh, I, I can define JZ to be uh, the one that I get um, just from the bottom component, the familiar one, this is just the uh, rotations. But let me do the one associated with the X. Let me call it TX. Um, instead of JX, I'll call it TX, uh, which is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's the one that's associated with A, and I'll call TY the one that's associated with B. Okay, 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, too small, minus 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay? So these are my three generators. And now you can see something um, uh, interesting. Obviously, the uh, commutator of um, Tx and Jz is equal to Ty. Um, you, can, you can check this easily, but I'll give you the sort of intuition for it uh, in a second. The commutator of Ty and Jz is equal to negative Tx. But, uh, so that's just like, looks just like, uh, you know, ordinary uh, angular momentum if X and Y were uh, Tx and Ty were Jx and Jy, but clearly Tx and Ty commute with each other. Okay, Tx and Ty just act in different spaces. Um, uh, so Tx and Ty just uh, commute with each other, okay? All right, so what is this algebra? Okay, are, are you familiar with this al algebra? Have you seen this uh, uh, algebra before? Well, this is in fact the, the, uh, the algebra of translations and rotations of the plane, just the two-dimensional plane, okay? So it's called the Euclidean group. And uh, so what, what, uh, so why, why, why is that? Well, if we have this, if we have, a, a, if we have the two-dimensional plane, x, y, uh, I can have the translations in x, I can have translations in y, and I can have uh, rotations in the, uh, X, Y plane, so that would be uh, uh, J, Z. And clearly these translations commute with each other. Uh, and clearly they have the, uh, the, the corresponding algebra uh, with Z, right? Because, uh, because uh, if we do, if we, if we rotate a little bit in Z, we mix TX with, with TY and TY with negative TX, right? So, so this algebra is just the symmetries of translations and rotations uh, on the uh, plane. Okay, so if we summarize then, um, we see that the little groups are different. They're sort of qualitatively different. Uh, for massive particles, 
Um, the massive little group is uh, rotations SO3 in D dimensions is SOD minus one, but the massless little group is the, uh, is the Euclidean group um, in, uh, uh, in, in two dimensions. Uh, and in general, it would be the Euclidean group in D minus two dimensions. If we did this in two in D uh, space time dimensions, okay? Um, now, let me give you uh, a little bit of uh, intuition, maybe more intuition about why this discontinuous uh, uh, transition happened. And um, uh, so, so to, to see the transition between these two things um, a little more smoothly, uh, uh, suppose that in the massive case, uh, suppose in massive case, um, we had taken the reference momentum not to be k-mu, uh, a particle at rest, but a particle boosted uh, uh, in a particular direction. So let's say I've taken k-mu to be uh, 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 m gamma, uh, m gamma v, uh, zero, zero, okay? With the usual gamma is one over root one minus v squared, okay? So, um, that's the uh, that's the that's the boosted particle, um, <clears throat> and you can you can do the analysis for the little group. I'll leave this. It's a very very short exercise, but I'll leave it an exercise for you to work out that uh, that the um, that the uh, if I if I call this the uh, the uh, What, what, what you find for the, for the uh, little group generators are J23, exactly as you'd expect, the rotations there. But uh, for the other two generators, we're gonna get a linear combination of J12, that's the uh, rotation in one, two, uh, plus something that's the boost in the two direction. And J31 minus the, the, uh, this velocity that's the boost in the three direction. So um, uh, that's what you'll find if you work out the a little group in, in this case. Um, so as the, when the velocity is zero, we have the usual three uh, uh, generators of uh, rotations. But as the velocity goes to one, um, uh, they, they shift to this J12 minus K2 and, and J31 minus the K3. And if you work out the algebra, what you find uh, if I call this guy t hat one two and this guy t hat um, two three uh, uh, three one, then you find that that the algebra is that t hat one two t hat two three, uh, sorry t hat three one is one minus v squared times the the rotation in the two three direction, while the other ones are um, what uh, what what you would be usual thing that we would have expected is this is t hat 3 1 and uh, t hat um, 3 1 j 2 3 is minus t hat 1 2 okay but the uh, interesting part is this 1 minus v squared here okay so so long as v is not equal to 1 okay so for any velocity that's not equal to 1 you can always rescale the generators uh, so that the symmetries are those of the rotation group, okay? Um, but if V is strictly equal to one, you can't do that uh, uh, rescaling, okay? So this is very much um, the way in which the Galilean symmetry emerges from the Lorentz symmetry in the limit as you spend the, uh, in the, limit as you spend the speed of light to uh, infinity. Okay, so technically it's a contraction of the, of the uh, underlying uh, uh, group. Um, and another intuitive picture is that uh, when the particle is at rest, we can think that uh, we're, we have uh, uh, rotations, we have asymmetries of the sphere, but what's going on when, the, wh when you boost the uh, particle is it's like you're making the radius of the sphere, it's like you're looking in the neighborhood of the, of the uh, North Pole, in the Z direction, but it's like you're making the, the radius of the sphere go like one over root one minus B squared, and this radius goes to infinity as V goes to one, okay? So what's going on is that we always have the symmetries of the sphere, 
But as you take V to one, it's like you're, you're, this rescaling of generators, it's forcing you to look closer and closer to the North Pole so that in the limit, it's the flat earth limit. Okay, in the limit, as the V goes to one, all you see are the, uh, in the limit as V goes to one, all you see are the symmetries associated with the flat version of the sphere. Um, and so, uh, so we still have JZ, but what, what used to be JX and JY are now just turning into translations in the X and the Y directions. Okay. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so now we've seen sort of uh, more, more technically this sort of intuitive difference between the uh, little groups for massive and massless particles. Okay. Very good. So um, <clears throat> now uh, this difference, let me just do one more thing and we'll take our break. Um, <laughs> so uh, this has uh, this difference between the little groups has a profound difference for what these labels are, what these labels can, uh, these labels sigma can uh, possibly be. So uh, as we've said already, if the particles are massive, since the little group is uh, SO3, these labels sigma are just spin. Sigma labels are just spin. That's the definition of what spin is. Okay? Spin are things that are representations of the rotation group. But now let's look at the, uh, uh, in the massless case, let's look at what the representations of the little group could be, right? Now notice, remember in this usual story of spin, in order to talk about any representation to begin with, you just diagonalize as many things as you can, right? So that's why uh, JX, JY, and JZ don't commute with each other. And so we pick one of them. We diagonalize JZ, that's the spin in the Z direction. And then, okay, then, uh, then, then the other two, um, uh, the other two generators, we can take linear combinations to make ladder operators. Uh, and that's how we understand spin in uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics. The situation is different than the Euclidean group. We can diagonalize more to begin with because Tx and Ty already commute with each other. Okay, so Tx and Ty commute. And then we have Tx and Jz is Ty and uh, Ty and Jz is minus Tx. But Tx and Ty already commute with each other. Okay, so these already commute. So I, I can label my states naively by the eigenvalues under Tx and Ty, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna label my states by whatever their eigenvalues are for Tx uh, and uh, Ty. I've just written those as little Tx and little Ty. So capital Txy on the state Tx and Ty is just given by uh, tx, little tx or y on this state. Okay, so it's just eigenstates of the translations. They're mutually commute, so I can uh, I can do that. However, let's say that tx and ty, even one of them is non-zero. Then I have a problem. Um, if they're non-zero, now let me act on the state with a rotation in the z direction. Okay, so let me see what happens if I take the state and I rotate by like e to the i theta jz on Tx and Ty. Well, you know what this is gonna do, like Tx and Ty are just a two dimensional vector. And so under rotation, this gets gonna kind of rotate to another vector. So this is going to be, you know, uh, this is going to be uh, Tx cos theta plus Ty sine theta, uh, uh, Ty cos theta minus uh, Tx sine theta, right? But the important point is that if I have any, Tx, Ty, non-zero here, then by acting with Jz, I'm gonna produce all these other states on the circle, right? And I will have all these states. I must have all of these states for all these different values of T uh, here. Okay, because why? Because starting from one of these states uh, by applying um, uh, rotations, I'm gonna get other states. That's the whole point of the, I mean, I start, start from any given state, I apply the symmetry, I get other states. So this tells me that whatever these labels sigma are have to be continuously infinite, all right? So that these are called continuous spin representations. 
And that's what comes out of the box uh, when you think about the representations of the little group. It's a very peculiar thing, okay? That, that the most obvious representation of the, of the little group for massless particles actually have an infinite continuous number of spins. It's not like the massive particles where we have, you know, you, have, you say spin one and you have three states. Spin a half, you have two states. Um, uh, here, there's a continuous infinite number of states uh, if you allow Tx and Ty to be non-zero, okay? Well, that's odd. We haven't seen these in, in nature. We have not seen massless particles that have a continuous infinity of a number of uh, degrees of freedom. And this actually remains kind of an interesting area of research. Every now and then people come back to try to see if it's possible to make sense of these continuous spin particles. Um, but uh, we haven't seen them uh, in nature. That's not a very good argument, but we haven't, we haven't, A, we haven't seen them in nature. B, the attempts to make theoretical sense of them are confusing at best uh, so far, even though some progress has been made over the last uh, five, 10, 10 years or so. Um, so what we're going to do at the moment is a sort of punt on this problem. And we have to somehow avoid this infinity, avoid continuous infinity. How do we avoid this continuous infinity? The only thing we can do is to choose, choose Tx and Y to equal zero. Okay. If we choose Tx and Y to equal zero, then we're nailed to the origin. All right. But then we just have one state, right? I have one state and I know that e to the i theta jz acting on the state where Tx and Ty are zero is just going to give me something proportional to the state again. And so it's just going to be some e to the i, some some value I'll call h theta uh, zero zero, right? And so we've learned what is the label associated with a massless particle. It only has a single label, okay? And the single label is this helicity h. Is that clear? So if I say this, uh, if I say it again, uh, and I say it in D space-time dimensions, the statement is that massive particles are uh, representations of SO D minus one. Massless particles will always have these funny continuous spin representations of the Euclidean group of D minus two. See, that the, has the same number of dimensions as, as SO D minus one. Okay, that's just the story we're talking about, but these are the funny continuous ones. If we want to avoid the continuous ones, so avoiding continuous nails us to this T to the origin. And now it gives us representations of SO D minus two. Okay, so that's the sort of famous drop in the, uh, in the number of degrees of freedom now in general for a general space-time dimension between massive and massless particles. Uh, and to say it one last time, the smooth thing that carries over smoothly with the number of, the amount of symmetry doesn't change, the number of generators doesn't change is rotations SO D minus one to the Euclidean group, D, uh, 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 Euclidean D minus two, but the, the representations with the Euclidean group have this continuous infinity in them unless we further send things to the origin. A after we send those T's to the origin, the only thing that we're left with are rotations around the direction of motion of the massless particle, which is SOD minus two. And that's this drop in the number of degrees of freedom between massive and massless particles, okay? But again, in four dimensions, in the familiar case of D equals four dimensions, um, uh, this is just a massive particle SO3 is spin S uh, that has two S plus one degrees of freedom, but massless, um, that's massive. Uh, massless is just uh, helicity. 
So H equals just plus or minus S. Um, uh, and as I alluded to last time, nothing at this point in our discussion even forces us to have both plus and minus. In theories that have parity symmetry, uh, uh, or at least approximately in parity symmetry, we're forced to have both uh, helicities. But at this point in our discussion, all we've learned is that, uh, is that uh, we, we can either have just plus or just uh, minus. Okay, perhaps this is a good a time to um, take a break and uh, ask for uh, questions. Questions? Yes, and this one by Prisco. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, about this fact that we are kind of uh, throwing away uh, possible representation yes. in the master's case. Yes, yes. This contradicts, you know, Gelman principle of the, you know, the totalitarian principle. Absolutely. So what's yes, yes. your right. view on that? Well, uh, the, uh, the uh, as I said, it, it, uh, in, um, in theoretical physics, it's never a good idea to uh, throw things away that, that appear to come out of the theory um, just because we haven't seen them yet in nature, because they might eventually show up somewhere in, uh, in the nature. So, so we get to be um, uh, chauvinists as theoretical physicists uh, to just study what our theory tells us um, is uh, interesting and, and you know, eventually the experimentalists will uh, find it. Um, uh, but in this case, um, uh, it, uh, it, it's a more confusing, situation because uh, when you start studying whether it's possible to describe these continuous spin particles in a consistent way, um, uh, it's not obvious that there is a consistently interacting theory for them, right? So, um, and in fact, uh, uh, the whole story of continuous spin particles or the development of them is a good example of this alternate point of view of thinking about uh, uh, the interaction of particles from this particle-centered um, um, on shell uh, point of view, because um, certainly you don't run into them obviously with Lagrangians or anything like that, right? And when you play with Lagrangians, you don't see these things come out, but, um, but you can nonetheless sort of play with them to see uh, from the perspective that I'll talk about um, in the next lecture, whether it's possible to write down consistently interacting amplitudes for, uh, for continuous spin particles um, with ordinary particles, with uh, gravity, um, and uh, uh, it's a complicated, it's a confusing subject. There, there, there is no known working example yet, um, but there isn't a theorem yet either that it's impossible. Okay, so uh, so um, uh, yeah, so that's so it's in a little bit of a, a limbo. It's also a little bit of a backwater. I mean, people aren't very actively working on this subject. There are some nice papers in the '70s. There are some uh, very nice papers uh, five or ten years ago by Philip Schuster and. Uh, uh, Italia Toro that returned to this uh, subject. So if you want to learn more about it, I would, I would encourage looking at these papers of Schuster and Toro. It's, a, it's an interesting subject. Um, uh, people had a few kind of uh, throwaway no-go theorems, like, oh, if you have infinitely many particles, then you'll screw up thermodynamics because, uh, you know, you would thermalize them and you'd have infinite specific heat and so on. I mean, uh, you know, you'd have some difficulties like that. Uh, those are not good arguments because when you have, uh, you know, uh, there might be infinitely many particles, but you don't have the same, but it's not obvious that the, that the strength of the couplings to, to each one of the sectors would thermalize all of them. Anyway, that, that's, that, those arguments are not good arguments. Um, the really strong question is whether um, uh, you can uh, write down, that the really invariant question is, is there a formula you can write down which is, the, uh, which is local and uh, conserves probability is unitary um, for the interactions of these particles. Again, I'll talk about that in the much more down to earth context of uh, simpler context of ordinary massless particles um, uh, uh, just in a moment now, um, uh, but people have not managed to, uh, uh, to write down fully consistent interactions for these guys yet. Uh, someone in the chat asked whether I could have a, a reference. Um, uh, I, I don't have the reference off the top, top of my head, but if you just go to Inspire and look at uh, Philip Schuster, um, yeah, Schuster uh, and Toro, and if you just look at the words continuous spin, if you just Google that, um, then you'll find the papers that I'm uh, talking about. 
and they'll have references to the older literature as well. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, so you said that in recent years, like some research developments has been made in continuous wind particles. Have yeah. they been able to pinpoint like an energy scale in which you might be able to see them, if at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, what there, um, uh, the, uh, the things that have been done are, I, I believe if I remember properly, something which uh, kind of, uh, something that does make sense is the interaction between uh, ordinary matter so this kind of uh, vertex, ordinary, ordinary, continuous spin particle, um, people have figured out what this, uh, uh, what that, what that vertex should look like, and um, and from there, I think there's a proposal for what this, uh, for what that process should uh, be. So uh, I think um, uh, there there is probably some, you know, you might look for massless, remember these are massless. So you'd look for some sort of long range interaction, maybe with very weak coupling, some long range interactions associated with these continuous spin uh, particles. I, I can't remember if uh, um, uh, any phenomenology was done with this. Um, uh, because again, it's at a very primitive stage to really even see if these kind of interactions are possible. Um, but uh, but Philip and uh, 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 Natalia who wrote these papers are, are dyed in the wool um, uh, people uh, with connections to experiments. So if it was possible to, um, uh, if it was possible to, to talk about experimental signals, I'm sure they did it in their paper. And uh, in terms of the things that are being done, is it largely, uh, are they suggesting more bosonic particles or fermionic particles or is, is there like? Uh, it's not, I, I think they were imagining the, uh, they were imagining the, or the yes, or no. yeah, I think that they're, they're imagining uh, uh, bosons, yeah. And you know the people have uh, you know what is this? Let me just say say something about it uh, quickly. Um, what what you should do in talking about this, of course, is instead of talking about this continuous T, um, you can go to a Fourier basis, right? You can go to a Fourier basis, and um, in that Fourier basis, you would just have an infinite number of spins. Okay, so so I'm it's just usual thing. Instead of talking about the position eigenstate on the circle, you go to the uh, momentum eigenstates on the circle. And so you can think of the continuous spin representation as being labeled by the radius. So this is a, a number rho. You can think of it as labeled by the radius and just an infinite number of spins. Okay, so n is just an infinite number of spins. n equals minus infinity to infinity. Okay, um, so I, I'm just saying that uh, that I can represent any point on on the circle here. Uh, any t I'm going to write um, as a, as a uh, or any t I'll write as a row e to the i theta, uh, and this state is then labeled. I can write as a sum of rho and n e to the i n theta. Okay, as n goes from minus infinity to infinity. So really, you should think about these continuous spin representations as a representation that's labeled by this number rho um, and an infinite number of spins. So somehow it looks like a, a, a particle with an infinite, a massless particle with an infinite number of spins, and there have been suggestions now and then that uh, these might be related to uh, strings in the high energy limit. If you imagine looking at strings at energies vastly bigger than the string scale, well, that also looks like somehow a system with an infinite number of spins of higher and higher tower of spins, but because you're going to infinite energies compared to the mass of the string states, that kind of looks like uh, a uh, naive, roughly looks like a system with infinitely many spins. Um, uh, infinitely many massless spins. So that's why there's some suggestion now and then that this continuous spin limit might be related to the high energy limit of string theory. And again, now and then people were interested in that question because maybe there's some, you know, the magic of string theory is associated with a huge enhancement of symmetries in the high energy limit. Um, so that's, uh, that might be one setting in which these things uh, matter. But anyway, that those are just words that haven't been made particularly con con concrete. But um, uh, but in any case, it is sort of it is kind of fascinating that uh, that it kind of sits there like a lump. Okay, that this is the whole story of Wigner is go. I mean, I I I, I, I hope I did uh, uh, justice to it, but I think it's kind of a spectacular story that you go 
very basic things. You just look at what is a particle, the representations, boom, 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 and then wham, this weird thing happens in the middle, which forces you to go to the origin and gives this dramatic difference between massive and massless. But it's just kind of sitting there that we didn't really, you know, address this other part of the story well yet, totally well yet. And it's lying around. It hasn't gone away. It has not been fully killed one way or the other. So th this is something that would be great to understand more at deep. But once we decide that we only care about finitely many particles, um, uh, which appears to be the case in nature, um, then, 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 we, then we go from these uh, continuous infinite things to the opposite limit where we lose degrees of freedom, right? Where somehow we, where the number of degrees of freedom jumps discontinuously between masses and masses. Any Thank other you. questions? Um, yes. So, um, like, maybe a stupid question, but like, all um, so all standard model particles that we have seen so far are tied to this like um, um, zero representation, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, is it just not, like another possibility that there are particles who have like infinite? Numbers. Okay. Yeah. Good. I it, just it, want to make it. It is another clear. possibility, as I said, uh, the, uh, and uh, it has not been settled one way or the other. But there's no known working example of an interacting theory with these things. No known fully working example. Okay. Um, but nor is it totally ruled out. So that that's why it's an interesting subject of uh, of, uh, of research. As I said, it's not a super active subject of research because it's very Con confusing. That's, of course, a good reason for it to be actively studied. I mean, you know, we should always be attracted to the most confusing things. That's uh, um, especially when they're sort of deep things. Um, but uh, it's not, anyway, it's, uh, it's not, yeah. That, that you, you should read these papers and form your own uh, uh, opinion of the state of affairs. But um, yeah, that, but they were quickly thrown out, as I said, in the early days, not for very good reasons. A, we haven't seen it in nature. B, you would instantly thermalize all of them and you would screw up, uh, I don't know, the, the specific heats, every, everything would be uh, uh, screwed up. I think those are not very good reasons, either one of them. Um, a, a better obstacle would be if it's somehow impossible to build consistent theories. By the way, it's not inconceivable that it's impossible to build consistent theories because as we'll discover, um, even for these ordinary representations, uh, it's impossible to have consistent theories of massless higher spin particles. If we have gravity, uh, I'll explain why, why that is. Um, uh, that's also something that's simply impossible. So just because things are allowed by the representation theory does not mean that you can build consistently interacting theories for them. So it could just be that it's similarly impossible to build consistently interacting theories for these continuous spin particles. I'm just saying that no sharp statement about this has been made in the year 2021, uh, one way or the other. Yeah. There's another question by Maria. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about something that we talked about yesterday. Um, you said that the reason why it um, is massless is not an argument of symmetry, but due to the discontinuity between the numbers of degrees of freedom of a massless photon? Sorry, which is, as, as we just discussed, which actually is an argument of symmetry, but it's an argument of the representations of the, of, of, it's a what is a particle argument, which boils down to representations of uh, uh, the Poincaré group, just like we uh, discussed. Um, I meant it's not an, a consequence of gauge symmetry, that it's kind of backwards. That gauge symmetry is something that we introduce in order to be able to describe massless particles in order to be able to like take into account this discontinuous difference between the number of degrees of freedom of massless and mass. Yeah. But sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. My question was that um, if it's not uh, so much an argument of uh, gauge symmetries, um, why do people um, normally solve these kind of problems of huge corrections with symmetry arguments, such as introducing supersymmetry? Oh, beautiful, beautiful, because. Uh, uh, because uh, there's, a there's a very important distinction here between gauge symmetries and global symmetries, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, gauge symmetries, well, we'll talk about it more in just a moment, but let me just say it now since you asked the question. It's these gauge symmetries that are a little bit in the mind of the theorist. They're not really there in nature. They're in the mind of the theorist as a very useful tool to describe the dynamics of massless particles with spin. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of gauge symmetries uh, and really the more correct word is gauge redundancies, is that the physical states are gauge invariant. 
Okay, so that's uh, again, we'll, we'll talk about this point more in a moment, but, uh, but global symmetries are different. Global symmetries relate different states to each other, right? So, um, and so global symmetries have consequences. Global symmetries are not in the mind of theorists. Global symmetries are real things. <laughs> they have consequences, for example, you know, uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they imply that different states of the system are degenerate uh, uh, with each other. Uh, when you spontaneously break a global symmetry, you got Goldstone goes on. So global symmetries are perfectly fine to rotate things uh, into um, uh, uh, each other. Then you can ask, uh, and so uh, and so, what uh, what what people often use in uh, trying to solve the hierarchy problem is to find a reason why uh, the Higgs is related by a global symmetry to a to a something else who's um, uh, that that we that we can understand, but. You can also see this from the point of view that I'm talking about, um, which is that the real mystery of the Higgs is that uh, the the uh, the real mystery of the Higgs is that um, it has spin zero, uh, and and that doesn't have a jump in the number a number of degrees of freedom between massive and massless. Every other spin, even spin a half, has a jump in the num number of degrees of freedom between massive and massless. Um, when uh, for even for spin a half, when you take into account that really we only have one helicity either the plus or minus solicity. So when we have something massive, we have both of them, okay? Um, so, uh, so from that point of view, in order to, the, the, the approaches to the hierarchy problem can be thought of as one way or another, finding a symmetry to relate the spin zero particle to a particle of a different spin. <laughs> so, and in supersymmetry, there's a global symmetry that'll mix up the spin zero particle with the spin a half particle. Um, of course, that's close to the conventional way of talking about things too, where we say chiral symmetries can protect the uh, spin a half uh, masses um, and supersymmetry lets you inherit the chiral symmetry for the spin a half partners for the, uh, for the uh, scalars. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, All right. no more questions? Can I ask a quick oh, question, Nima? Yeah. Uh, no, I was wondering about the continuous spin uh, so you, you mentioned that uh, maybe uh, this paper of Schuster and Toro uh, provided uh, the two, two interactions of, higher, of this continuous spin with ordinary massless yes. spin particles. So I was wondering, in principle, one could um, take these amplitudes and, and then uh, construct the ideas running for, for the interactions. And has someone checked that? Um, no, no. I think, and and if and you you'll see that the that the state of affairs is, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean that they've written down they've they've written down sort of on shell uh, three particle amplitudes, um, and uh, even before getting to the RG running and things like that, trying to understand the kind of tree level exchange is already um, uh, interesting. I think that they got to the level mm -hmm. of understanding the the. Uh, Tree level exchange, but um, uh, I think really the, the sort of question that's remaining is to establish the consistency of this beyond the very simplest things that they've uh, looked at before going to the questions of the running and stuff, stuff, stuff like that. That uh, I mean, the, the the state of affairs is much more primitive than uh, than than even what you have in have in mind. I think, but okay. uh, I, I don't actually remember the uh, details of this, and there may have been more development since I paid attention. So I would, I would just encourage you to look at the uh, the uh, paper. It's very clearly written written set of papers. Okay, thanks. I check. Okay. All right. Little break. Uh, all right. Great. Five minutes. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. I thought we I thought we had the break already. Okay, that's fine. We'll we'll come back in five minutes. Great. See you in five minutes.
if there are any uh, students on the line, maybe I can, uh, um, if you guys can uh, raise your hand, just, just out of uh, curiosity. Um, uh, how many people, uh, um, I'm just curious, uh, the, 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 uh, the stuff of this lecture today, how many of you have seen this sort of standardly in your uh, graduate courses and so on? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So it, it seems to be a relatively small fraction of, of, uh, of you guys. So uh, it seems uh, worth, uh, uh, so I hope you guys found it, found it useful. Um, but we're, we're going to be turning now just from uh, the basics of this uh, representation theory to some uh, physics. So um, uh, should, we, should we start uh, Andrea or, or wait a little? For sure, longer? please, please, please. Okay, great, okay, very good. Let me do that then. Um, okay, so let's go back here. <clears throat> uh, where was I? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. All right, so um, now that we've learned uh, uh, what particles are, uh, let's ask about uh, interactions. So we're, we're going to be in interested um, in uh, scattering processes involving, uh, involving particles. Um, and uh, um, so uh, just talking about, uh, so, le so let's imagine that we're just gonna scatter massless particles for now. So we're gonna focus on massless particles for the rest of this discussion, because um, that's where something really new is uh, happening. Um, and so uh, what is the data then? What is the data for, for a scattering process? You have to give me the momentum um, where all these P squareds will be zero. So, so all these P A squareds, I'll usually label the N particles by, the, by A. So A equals one through N. So all the P squareds are on shell. Um, but I also have to give you the helicities of the particles, okay? So, so the labels for the scattering process are P1H1 up to PNHN. And I'm working on the convention that all the momenta are incoming, okay? So that momentum conservation is just the statement uh, um, that the sum of the momenta is zero, okay? Of course, when we do that, some of the energies have to be positive and some of them have to be negative. And we think about the energies that are positive as incoming states and the energies that are negative as outgoing states. Okay, so that's the, if we want to connect to the usual in out scattering process, but this is the uh, more convenient way of uh, labeling the states. And so um, if we just think for a moment, uh, what is the sort of group theory? What's the representation properties of the amplitude? If I have this state that's labeled by momenta, and helicities, and I have an amplitude that depends on uh, these uh, labels, okay? Then what does this object have to do um, under Lorentz transformations? Well, what it has to do is the following, that if I Lorentz transform the momenta, I have to pick up a little group phase So this is what an actual amplitude does. Right? And that's just, uh, uh, and I, I hope that's, uh, that's obvious. Um, we imagine that the actual, that, that, the, that the scattering matrix is actually Poincare invariant. So it has to have the delta function for momentum conservation. Okay, um, uh, that's translational invariant. But under Lorentz transformations, we just saw that if I do a Lorentz transformation, I need to pick up uh, the little group phase on the state. Okay? And so, so that means that this amplitude is not Lorentz invariant, but if I do a Lorentz transformation, every particle has to pick up its uh, corresponding uh, little group phase. Okay? 
right? So these are the uh, transformation properties of the amplitude. Now, I hope you notice that this is not exactly what we talk about in courses when we uh, talk about uh, amplitudes, let's say for the scattering of photons, okay? Just to give uh, an example. So the, in the usual formalism, in the usual formalism um, of field theory uh, and Feynman diagrams, uh, let's say we, we have some amplitude for photons. Well, we immediately talk about not an amplitude, but uh, what's sometimes called the Feynman amplitude, which is an amplitude in quotation marks, okay? the Feynman amplitude, which now has some Lorentz indices on these m's, right? m mu one up to m mu n. You know, we see this like all the time when you draw some diagram like this, you just see it nakedly because there's a mu index here and a new uh, uh, index there, okay? So these Feynman amplitudes are, are just Lorentz tensors, right? They have these, they have these mu indices. And the actual amplitudes are not Lorentz tensors. Notice there's no mu's here, right? There's no mu's here at all. There's no mu's here, okay? There's just something which has the helicity label. There's not any mu's, okay? So now how do we actually deal with this? Well, the way we deal with this is something which in courses is often sort of said quickly or at the end, or you, may, you don't really care about it um, uh, that much is you say that at the end of the day, you first calculate this guy with Feynman diagrams, and then you dot into polarization vectors, right? So in other words, the, the uh, imagined connection is that the amplitude for P and H is this M mu, let's say I just had spin one particles, is, is this guy that now just depends on P, but now you multiply by some polarization vector, epsilon mu one for helicity H1 uh, and momentum P1 up to epsilon mu n Hn uh, for Pn, okay? So here we multiply by uh, polarization vectors, okay? Okay, now, and this is really not a coincidence, okay, because uh, what is the polarization vector doing, okay? Um, the fact that in the usual formalism, we have even this notion of a polarization vector, um, a polarization vector, uh, the presence of polarization vectors is an explicit, is an explicit reminder that, uh, that we are using fields to describe particles, right? So why is it that uh, we have polarization vectors? Because really we imagine that that A mu business, that M mu business is about some field A mu of X and that in the free approximation, when we just have free propagation, we write A mu of X as some polarization vector epsilon mu e to the I P dot X, right? But what, what is this doing? This is solving the classical equation, you know, something like box A mu equals zero, right? So this is putting the field on shell. Field on shell is giving me particles, right? But the actual M mu one up to mu n thing that we're computing is really about the underlying fields. And then we restrict the fields on the outside uh, to be on shell in order to uh, describe the scattering of the particles, okay? So, uh, I'm, so I'm just emphasizing to say that this very notion that you have, so uh, um, just to emphasize again, what we calculate with Feynman diagrams is not an amplitude. This part is not an amplitude, okay? That's uh, has no relation to an amplitude. We convert it to an amplitude by dotting into uh, polarization vectors, okay? Now you might, this might already bother you a little bit. You know, why are we talking about something that has nothing to do with the actual uh, scattering process that we care about and involves uh, these other things and we dot into polarization vectors, okay? 
that, that's a, this is the, a, a kind of a zeroth order point uh, in, our, in the development of the subject. We've learned what particles are. Uh, uh, we learned the difference between massive and massless. We start thinking about what amplitudes are. And here there's a bifurcation point where, where you either sort of go down the direction of fields. And if you can read more in Weinberg volume one about why fields are inevitable and nice and everything is great in order to describe the interaction of particles. That discussion actually begins with spin zero particles where everything is very simple. And then there's more and more complication as you go to higher and higher spin, <laughs> okay? Um, and we're gonna take that attitude now, okay? So don't worry, we're not gonna jump to something uh, very different, but I wanna stress that already at this point, there is a second strategy that you could take, which is to never talk about the fields, only talk about particles, never see polarization vectors, absolutely directly talk about what the amplitudes are. And, um, and, and we, we, we might talk about that too, um, uh, uh, depending on how I decide to run things. Uh, uh, we may or may not talk about that uh, tomorrow. We won't have time to talk about it today. Um, but anyway, we're gonna proceed with this more usual way of thinking about things with the uh, uh, polarization. Okay. Now, um, for massive part, we're talking about massless ones, but let me just remind you for massive particles, um, there's no problem with polarization vectors, okay? Um, there's no problem with polarization vectors. Uh, and let's think about um, uh, uh, what I mean. Uh, so uh, for example, for spin one, um, I would introduce an epsilon mu of P. And now epsilon mu, how many degrees of freedom are there in epsilon mu? There are four degrees of freedom, right? Epsilon zero, one, two, three. Um, but we know that, uh, that, uh, that massive spin one has only three degrees of freedom. So what is this difference between three and four? Well, we know that the polarization vector satisfies a constraint, right? What is the constraint that it satisfies? It satisfies that epsilon dot P equals zero. Okay, so that's one constraint on a polarization vector. And again, if we go to the rest frame where P mu is equal to M zero, uh, this just says that epsilon mu is equal to zero epsilon, right? And that's perfectly good. So these are my three spin states. Okay. And if you think about where the, if you think about the, uh, where this uh, uh, comes from for the, you know, massive spin one field equation, d mu a mu equals zero, which is in momentum space p dot epsilon equals zero, is a consequence of the equations of motion. Right, so, so as you would expect, when you solve the equations of motion, um, I'm just relating all the pictures to each other. You solve the equation of motion for massive spin one, you discover the solutions are epsilon mu e to the i p x, where epsilon dot p equals zero, okay? So no problem. The degrees of freedom match between massive and massless. Of course, you have to put a constraint on the polarization vector, though, okay? And, and, uh, and the underlying field picture that comes from the equation of motion, but even if you didn't know about the underlying fields, um, if you just wanted to somehow convert these m mu one up to mu n, if you wanted to convert them to something that only transformed under spin by inventing these polarization vectors, uh, it would be fine. There's a simple constraint on the polarization vectors that makes the degrees of freedom match. The difficulty for massless particles is the following. So what we want to imagine is that there is a polarization vector epsilon mu maybe it depends on the helicity and P, right? And we want to uh, uh, assume that this polarization vector exists such that uh, when I do a, a Lorentz transformation, epsilon mu H of, of lambda P, well, but this is just lambda, you know, mu nu epsilon nu H of P, and maybe it picks up a little group phase. Okay, so if I'm talking about spin one, uh, maybe this is what I uh, what I uh, wanted to do. Okay. Now, notice if we have such an object, if these polarization vectors exist, then if I use them to dot into the uh, the Feynman amplitude, m mu one through mu n, um, this object would transform correctly. So that's the kind of point is that these polarization vectors are kind of, uh, they, they, the, the, the polarization vectors have, are, are supposed to have one index that's Lorentz and one index, the helicity that's little group. 
And so they're supposed to transform on one side with Lorentz and on the other side with little group. And in this way, when you contract them into a Lorentz tensor, they give you something that just transforms under, under the little group, okay? So that's our desire for what polarization vectors should be. The analog of that definitely works in the massive case, okay? Of course, it's not a phase, it's a bit, but, uh, uh, it, but, but, the, uh, but the, the polarization vectors transform like Lorentz transformations on the mu index and like, uh, and like spin one under their other spin index. Okay. So this is what we might hope to want for massless uh, spin one. But there's a fundamental difficulty. No such polarization vectors exist. And it's easy to see why. First, let's just see it from a degree of freedom argument. Okay, so we know that massless spin one has, let's say, two degrees of freedom. Um, epsilon mu uh, equals zero, one, two, three, as usual, has four degrees of freedom. So we see that already in the massive case. Well, as in the massive case, let's say we impose that epsilon p equals zero. Okay. If we do that, we go from four to three degrees of freedom, but then we're done. There's no other Lorentz invariant constraint that I can put on this polarization vector, okay? There's nothing I can do. There's no other uh, constraint uh, uh, I can put on it. So it just seems that I have three degrees of freedom. So three is not equal to two. And what is the, uh, what's, what's the problem? Uh, uh, the, the, the problem is that if you give me any epsilon mu, that satisfies these constraints, then epsilon mu plus anything times p mu will also satisfy these constraints um, uh, because if epsilon dot p equals zero, then epsilon plus alpha p dot p equals zero as well uh, since p squared equals zero. All right, so that's our first hint that there's something wrong. There's no way that we can uh, pick out two degrees of freedom from a polarization vector. Um, we can get from four to three, but then we're stuck, okay? There's no way of uh, uniquely picking out uh, two, uh, uh, there's no way of canonically picking out two degrees of freedom out of the three uh, for the polarization vectors that sat satisfy epsilon dot p equals zero, okay? And um, uh, so, uh, so what does that mean in uh, practice? So, so I'm telling you polarization vectors don't exist, right? Or better yet, the polarization vector, the word the for the polarization vector for a given helicity particle doesn't exist. Now you say, Nima, what are you talking about? Um, I've learned in school ever since I was a child that the polarization vectors, and I'm even very fancy for plus or minus helicity, I know there's a one over root two and a one plus or minus I, because I'm so cool, I know about I's. Okay, that these are the polarization vectors for, um, for uh, massless uh, spin one particles. What are you talking about? Screw you. You know, they're, 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 there they are. Uh, what do you mean there's no polarization vector? Well, what I mean is that these zeros here don't mean anything, okay? So this is a polarization vector for a particle uh, that's supposed to be moving in this, uh, uh, um, uh, that's, that's supposed to be moving uh, like 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 this, right? Um, sorry, let me uh, let me let me do this. Uh, um, so if we have a particle moving in the z direction, let let, 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 let me let me do it right. If we have a particle, I, I wrote it wrong. If we have a particle p mu. Uh, let's say moving in the z direction, then we say that the polarization vectors plus or minus are like uh, zero, one over root two, uh, plus or minus i over root two, zero, right? This you've seen in uh, books all the time. Um, what I'm saying is that these zeros don't mean anything, okay? That you could have equally well written this as any alpha, one over root two, plus or minus i over root two, alpha. And there's no Lorentz invariant way 
of, of uh, declaring those entries to be zero. And in fact, you can just check. This is, a, this is a check that you can do, check. Okay, there are Lorentz transformations, lambda p, that leave p invariant. They're part of the little group, okay? So you can just check. If you take a Lorentz transformation that leaves p invariant, when p is equal to you know, e, zero, zero, e, and that, that, uh, that lambda epsilon um, will not look like zero, uh, uh, one over root two uh, uh, plus minus i over root two, zero. It won't have the zeros there anymore. In general, the zeros will get turned into some non-zero alpha, which depends on the Lorentz transformation, okay? So this should really bug you. That uh, that you so you know we've done all this work with with the Feynman diagrams we calculate all of these Lorentz invariant tensors everything is very beautiful so the, the, everything is naively Lorentz invariant and it is Lorentz invariant at the level of the Feynman amplitudes but at the final step when we dot into polarization vectors epsilon mu of uh, p one blah blah epsilon mu n h n of p n These things don't actually exist. They don't exist. In other words, uh, they're not, they don't exist in a Lorentz invariant sense, okay? If I make a choice for them, then uh, if I do a Lorentz transformation, I'll get another choice. Those zeros will be turned into, uh, will be turned into something else. And therefore we have to introduce a new idea here. So we have to introduce a new idea that we don't associate a state, a particle state is not associated, not associated with a single polarization vector, epsilon mu, but instead we have to associate it with a whole equivalence class of polarization vectors, okay? So we have to associate it with the equivalence class of polarization vectors, epsilon mu, where epsilon mu and epsilon mu plus anything times p mu are identified. In other words, we have to declare that if I make, uh, if I choose any polarization vector from the set, they all describe the same physical state, okay? Because while an individual polarization vector is not Lorentz invariant, obviously the whole equivalence class of them is Lorentz invariant. If you do a Lorentz transformation on one polarization vector, you'll land on another polarization vector in the set. The, the new polarization vector will only differ by the old one by something proportional to p mu. Okay, so if you, if you, so if you just say that, that you're not gonna label a state with a unique uh, epsilon, but only by a member of this class uh, where two epsilons are identified if they differ from p mu, then that is a Lorentz invariant way of talking about the estate. Okay, is that clear? Any questions about that? And notice that this alpha can depend on P in an arbitrary way. Okay, so just some general uh, alpha of P. So uh, just to be a little bit loose now, we've seen our first instance of gauge redundancy. And you see why the word is redundant, right? Because we are using um, uh, we are saying that epsilon mu and epsilon mu plus any alpha p mu are the same state. The whole point is that we have to enlarge what we meant by, uh, by labeling a state to allow all of these labels to describe exactly the same thing in order for, now, and by the way, why are we doing all of this? Because we made the decision early on that we're gonna first compute Feynman amplitudes and then dot into polarization vectors. If we do things another way where we never talk about Feynman amplitudes and directly talk about the particles to begin with, as I alluded to earlier, we never have to see this. Okay? And uh, again, I might come back, depending on how I'm doing for time, I might uh, dis uh, discuss this more fully later. But having made this choice to describe physics in this language, we're forced into this gauge redundancy to talk about uh, massless particles um, uh, uh, with uh, spin one in this example and any, any other spin as well, okay? Um, but I hope it's clear why the word is redundancy. Unlike ordinary symmetries that relate to different states to each other, 
Here, this is something we are inventing from the outside in order to allow many different labels to describe the same state. Okay. And uh, why is the word gauge here? Um, well, uh, because this is the momentum space analog of what we're used to seeing in position space. So in position space, we have a mu and a mu plus d mu alpha, okay? And we say that these are meant to describe the same configuration, okay? So that's the, that's the gauge transformation. And in momentum space for the polarization vectors, that's just this, right? So, uh, the derivative here turns into a p mu. So this is epsilon mu goes epsilon mu plus p mu alpha. Okay. All right. But there's a very big consequence of uh, of uh, what what uh, there's a very big restriction on uh, on on the Feynman amplitude. There's a restriction on uh, this amplitude m mu one through mu n, um, if indeed uh, the 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 physics only depends on this equivalence class of epsilon mu with the uh, whoops with the uh, epsilon identified with epsilon plus alpha p, this just says practically that. If you dot epsilon mu one through uh, epsilon mu n m mu one mu n to get uh, uh, to get the actual amplitude, um, we should get the same answer if we replace any given epsilon mu with uh, epsilon mu plus any alpha of p times p mu. And that tells us that whatever these m, whatever these m mu one through mu n are, they have to satisfy that if I take any one of the indices m mu, p mu, and whatever the other indices are, that if I dot that into p mu, I should get zero. Right? Because again, that's just what I get. If I take any one of these epsilons and I shift it to epsilon mu plus alpha p mu, if I'm going to get the same answer, it had better be that uh, that the p mu dotted into uh, uh, m mu one gives me zero, right? So this is a restriction. Then we thought when we were playing with Feynman. Uh, when we're playing with Feynman amplitudes, we thought that anything we did was Lorentz invariant, everything is fine, but it isn't. In order for it to be physically Lorentz invariant for, uh, uh, for describing the amplitudes of the scattering particles, whatever the, the rules are that give us this m mu have to uh, be such that they satisfy this uh, important constraint, okay? And only then do you get something that's actually physically Lorentz invariant. Now, in textbooks, this is often called the on-shell ward identity. And in the usual way of thinking about things, you begin by thinking about a Lagrangian, and then you love gauge symmetry because it's so beautiful and lovely. Uh, and then, uh, then you have to gauge fix because it's confusing. Uh, you get something infinite if you don't gauge fix, so you gauge fix the thing. You have the gauge symmetry, but then you gauge fix it. And then a uh, consequence, a later consequence of the underlying gate symmetry of the, of the Lagrangian is the on-shell word edit. From the point of view uh, where we're just thinking about writing down consistent uh, interactions for the scattering particles in this formalism, the on-shell word identity is the most important thing. It's the, it's the starting statement, okay? So you have to ensure that you have the on-shell word identity. Otherwise, the scattering uh, isn't, uh, despite appearances, is not Lorentz invariant. And I now want to show um, uh, in a way that's as closely related to the usual language as possible, um, uh, uh, how this implies that if we're gonna describe the interactions of massless particles, we need to have something like, uh, 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 something like gauge and barrier, okay? So let's do a little example. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Andrea, how am I doing for a time? Uh, in principle, you're 10 minutes over time. Oh, in principle, I'm 10 minutes over time. Okay. 
Um, hmm. Let's see what I can do. Um, Uh, can I have around uh, 10 more minutes? Sure. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to make two more points uh, along, along these, uh, 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 these lines, and then, then, then uh, we can call it a day for it today. Um, okay, so I want to do, do, do an example. Uh, let's say I want to describe, um, I want to describe uh, massless spin one. Um, interacting uh, with uh, spin zero, okay? So just, uh, um, but forget about all the stuff you learned in uh, books uh, uh, for, for a second, other than the fact that we're gonna write down Lagrangians and Feynman rules and, and, and stuff, stuff like that, okay? Um, but uh, don't worry about gauge invariance. Is it pretty not, you know, let's just, let, let's just, uh, uh, we're physicists, we're not philosophers. So we're just practically, we want to go and build, build a Lagrangian here. So what, what would I do? So let's say for the spin one part, um, what Lagrangian would you write down? Um, and, and if you've never heard of anything, and if you're honest with yourself, you would never write down negative a quarter, F mu nu, F mu nu. What a weird, complicated thing, F mu nu, D mu a nu minus, why the hell would you do that? Um, what, what you'd write down if you're just a dumb guy and you should be a dumb guy whenever you possibly can be, is um is uh, just a d mu a nu square okay so that's the that's the first thing that that I would do oh no we're scared it's not gauge invariant fuck that okay that uh, um it, this gives you a perfectly decent propagator the propagator is uh, you know minus eta mu nu over p squared everything is fine so we can start right nothing nothing is going wrong we're just we're just gonna gonna start by the way if you're nervous uh. When we start with negative a quarter f mu nu squared, and then we gauge fix, this is what we end up getting after we gauge fix, right? If we do the usual Feynman gauge with like the, you know, alpha equals one or something. So it can't be such a stupid thing to do because that's actually what, what we get. Except instead of starting by saying we love gauge invariance and gauge fixing, we just write down a propagator that works to begin with. Okay, so, so uh, you should never be scared. You should just do the most obvious thing first, but remember what the important physical constraints are, right? So, so then what else could I do? I have my scalar, so the scalar would be some d phi squared, okay? And now let's just write what the dimensionless interactions are just by dimensional analysis between phi and this, uh, between phi and a. So I can have one coupling, which is the, the, the usual one, phi star d mu phi uh, a mu, okay? And, uh, and this has nothing to do with gauge invariance. It's just some coupling I can write down. So I'll call that coupling G. And there's another coupling that I could write down. I'll call it G prime. I'll just put the squared there for fun. Uh, phi star phi a mu a mu. Okay. So if I know absolutely nothing else, these are the interactions that I would write down that are dimensionless uh, in, this, in this model. Okay. So just using dimensional analysis to write down some coupling constants. Now, because you're so smart, you know that I'm supposed to choose G prime equals G. So that's the covariant derivative, blah, blah, blah. I'm not so, so uh, smart, okay? I'm just writing down the, uh, the most obvious interactions there are, and up we go. We're gonna go computing Feynman amplitudes in this series, and there's nothing wrong. So let's, let's compute the Compton scattering, okay? So I would take this uh, diagram, da da da, uh, and this guy, okay, da da da. So here, this would have a G and a G, G and a G, and there would also be this diagram, with the uh, uh, G prime squared. Again, I just put the squared there for uh, con convenience. And notice that no matter what G and G prime are, these are gonna give me Lorentz invariant Feynman amplitudes. Okay, so nothing wrong. They give me Lorentz invariant Feynman amplitudes. So um, what's wrong here? What is wrong is that when I attempt to convert these Feynman amplitudes to actual amplitudes by dotting with polarization vectors, I have to make sure that they satisfy that, uh, that identity that, that says that it doesn't matter which representative of the polarization vectors I use in order to describe the photons. So I have to do a check that P mu acting on M mu nu actually gives me zero, right? And uh, I was actually gonna do this little exercise uh, for you. It's really a, a three line exercise. So I won't do it for you. I'll leave it uh, for you to do it yourself. Literally just compute 
this diagram, this one, it's a three line computation. And for example, you'll find that if you just have these two, that P mu M mu nu is not equal to zero. And you're forced to have this other guy in order for P mu uh, M mu nu to be zero. And in fact, uh, having that is going to force that G prime is equal to G. And so, uh, so beginning with this more primitive condition, which uh, to say for the fifth time is encoding the fact that the, that the Lorentz invariant Feynman amplitudes turn into Lorentz invariant scattering amplitudes for the massless particles, um, which forces this gauge redundancy in the description using polarization vectors. Um, that tells you that, that the Lagrangian you have to use has to have some special property, has to relate different couplings to uh, uh, each other in order to make this on cell word entity true. And the fact that the underlying uh, redundancy looks so similar to look so similar to the gauge redundancy in position space is a clue that one way of doing this is to write down a Lagrangian that has the gauge symmetry. But remember, the, in the end of the day, when you're done getting something you can calculate with, the Lagrangian never has gauge symmetry. It's always been gauge fixed. And so the claim is that the Lagrangians that give you uh, uh, Feynman amplitudes that satisfy the onshell word identities are just those Lagrangians that come from a classical Lagrangian where you add a gauge fixing term to, uh, to fix the uh, gauge. Okay, so that's, the, that, that's, a, that's an interesting non-trivial non claim going backwards. So I'm not saying uh, start with gauge symmetry, the path integral, uh, it's infinite, so you gauge fix. After a lot of work, you get to the onshell word identity. I'm showing go backwards, begin with this practical question of trying to build Lagrangians that satisfy this rule, and you'll discover the only way of doing it is to, um, uh, uh, is to get your Lagrangian from a gauge invariant one by adding gauge fixing terms in an appropriate way. All right, so, uh, so I encourage you to do this exercise uh, uh, yourself. And um, in, uh, in the last five minutes, I actually want to um, uh, talk about uh, 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 a more general thing that, that follows from this kind of uh, argument. So uh, I'm telling you how this was done in, uh, um, uh, in uh, I, I just made a claim for you that any Lagrangian that you get, uh, any, any Lagrangian that's going to make this work has got to come from an underlying gauge invariant Lagrangian with gauge fixing. Um, the same thing would be true in gravity. If you had a massless spin two, it has to arise from, so let's say for a massless spin two, just to stress the point, massless spin two, uh, now I have a polarization vector epsilon mu nu, and I have to identify epsilon mu nu with epsilon mu nu plus alpha mu p nu plus alpha nu p mu. Okay, so that's the analog of, uh, of epsilon goes to epsilon plus p. Um, uh, uh, if you have massless uh, spin two, and notice that this is the same in position space as h mu nu is identified with h mu nu plus d mu alpha nu plus d nu alpha mu. And this is nothing other than linearized general covariance, gen linearized uh, 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 diffeomorphisms. And, uh, and it, but it's exactly the, uh, the same claim is that if I have uh, now uh, in gravity, uh, an amplitude mu one, nu one, mu two, nu two, and so on, I have to ensure that if I dot this into P mu one, I get zero, okay? So this is the onshell ward identity for gravity. And once again, the claim is that the only way to have a Lagrangian for massless spin two particles that, re that respects this is if that Lagrangian comes from a generally covariant Lagrangian, the full nonlinear diffeomorphisms, not just the linearized ones, okay? What we see on shell is just this linearized uh, uh, diffeomorphism, but that's all that's needed, okay? So just the linearized uh, uh, diffeomorphisms, um, this on shell word entity forces the underlying Lagrangian to be generally covariant up to gauge fixing terms, of course, okay? Which then we, we use to actually uh, do the uh, computation. But instead of going through a sort of a proof of that uh, statement, I want to give you I want to give you a sense for where where it comes from, and at the same time uh, uh, tell you two celebrated facts um, or celebrated fact about the Weinberg soft theorems. Okay, so it's really fast, so uh, you'll see how how easy it is. It's not, uh, um, and uh, um, <clears throat> uh, but from here we're going to uh, we're we're going to learn uh, something quite uh, uh, dramatic. So Weinberg asked this question in the 60s. Imagine you have some scattering process to begin with for some charged particles. So there's some amplitude here. Uh, um, 
Uh, and he asked, what is the amplitude for emitting uh, a, a photon? One more photon. Okay, so maybe there's so there's a bunch of charged particles. But what is the amplitude for emitting a photon in the limit as the momentum of this photon becomes soft? In the limit as the momentum of the photon goes to zero. And if you think about it for a second, um, it, the dominant diagrams uh, uh, that contribute as the momentum goes to zero are exactly ones where the photon is attached to the external legs of the diagram rather than the internal ones. And why is that? That's because it's in this diagram here that I would have a propagator like one over P plus Q squared minus M squared. Okay, if this particle is mass M and this momentum is P, okay, maybe this is P, P plus Q, all right? So, and uh, because P is on shell, this is equal to one over two P dot Q. Okay, Q squared is equal to zero, P squared equals M squared. So this is one over P dot Q. And so this blows up as Q goes to zero, this uh, uh, blows up. Whereas um, if you did this on any internal line, uh, the particles are off shell in the, in the internal line. And so we don't get this uh, divergence as Q goes to zero. Okay, so, uh, so therefore, if we want to see what the amplitude is for emitting um, a soft photon, it suffices to just look at the uh, external legs. Now, let's just think for a second, what could this vertex be? Okay, of course, we know what we expect it to be from the, Lagrangian, but um, but even if we didn't know anything about the uh, Lagrangian, if this is particle J, maybe there's some coupling constant Ej that we could call the charge. But the biggest interaction that it could have with the photon would would involve the polarization vector of the photon dot the momentum of this particle. After all, it could either dot the momentum of the particle or it could dot the the Q um, of the photon. And of course, epsilon dot Q is equal to zero. Okay, so, uh, so um, this is the largest interaction that I could, I could have involving the hard momentum of the, uh, of the photon. This is also the interaction that would give rise to long range forces, inverse square law forces and so on. So that's the assumption that we're making. We're looking at the strongest interactions that the biggest interactions that the photon could uh, have. Okay, and, and therefore uh, with every leg, we would have this factor associated with the vertex, and then we would have this propagator that we just talked about, pj dot q, coming from that. So whatever else is going on here, from the jth leg, we'd have something like that. And therefore, Weinberg says that the amplitude for emitting a photon, an extra photon, is equal to the amplitude beforehand multiplied by this factor, the sum over all legs, ej, pj dot epsilon, divided by two pj dot q, where q is the, uh, where, where q is the momentum of the photon, all right? Okay, beautiful. So this is what, uh, this is what dominates as, as q goes to zero. So that's the soft photon. Now let's uh, apply this rule that the answer had better not depend on whether we choose epsilon or uh, um, I should be able to shift epsilon to epsilon plus anything times Q. And so the answer should, should be the same. So what happens if I do that? Uh, in other words, what happens if I dot Q into, this, uh, into the corresponding uh, Feynman amplitude or I do this uh, shift here? Um, well, uh, I find that I have to have that zero is equal to the sum over J, uh, EJ, and I'm gonna replace epsilon with Q. So it's PJ dot Q divided by two PJ dot Q. So the, so the PJ dot Qs cancel. And I learned that this has to equal the sum over J EJ. So I learned something beautiful that the only way to consistently couple the photon to these J particles is if the sum over the charges is equal to zero. I have to have charge conservation. I didn't put that in. I didn't put anything about the underlying Lagrangian, gauge invariance, anything like that. Um, but the only way to consistently couple a photon with the, this leading dominant coupling, um, the only way to consistently couple a photon um, uh, is such that because, uh, because of the behavior of the amplitude and the soft limit is especially simple, um, we learned that we have to have, that, that, that we have, to have charge, charge conservation. All right, let's continue this argument. And now imagine that we are 
uh, emitting a spin two particle. Okay, so this would be some mu nu. Now exactly the same argument for the jth leg. For the jth leg, I would emit uh, uh, a spin two. So I would write down the leading interaction I could write down would be epsilon mu nu, pj mu, pj nu. Okay. <clears throat> so, and some coupling constant, I'll call it kappa j. <clears throat> And uh, once again, from this propagator, I'd have an over two pj dot q. And so <clears throat> Weinberg would tell you that the amplitude for emitting uh, anything plus uh, a soft graviton with momentum q is equal to the amplitude without it multiplied by the sum over all j, this coupling constant kappa j, P j mu P j nu epsilon mu nu over two P j dot Q. Once again, if I uh, replace epsilon mu nu with epsilon mu nu plus alpha mu P nu Q nu plus alpha nu Q mu, I have to get the same answer. And so that means that if I, if I strip off the epsilon mu nu and just dot this into just Q, I should get zero, okay? So, uh, so that, that, that implies that the sum over j, kappa j, p j mu, uh, p j dot q over two p j dot q is equal to zero. And so I learn that the sum over j of kappa j, p j mu is equal to zero. Now that's really interesting. That's the analog that we found before. The sum of e j has to equal zero. This is again, the sum of the charges has to equal zero, but the charges in gravity have an extra factor of the, of the momentum in them. Okay, well, if you think about this, at first this looks impossible because I already know by momentum conservation that all the momenta have to add up to zero, okay? So this is putting yet another constraint on the momenta that some different linear combination of the, of the momenta have got to add up to zero. And that would mean that the amplitude vanishes except for some maybe very special angles where this is uh, possible, right? So in order for this not to force the amplitude uh, to vanish, what has to be the case? All the kappa j's have to be equal to each other, okay? So we must have all the kappa j's equal. They're all universal and equal to something that we can call one over m Planck. So we've discovered the principle of equivalence. the universal coupling of gravity. But we've discovered it not by thinking about falling elevators and uh, curved space time or anything like that. We've discovered it as a consequence of the consistency of special relativity and quantum mechanics, right? Okay. And, uh, uh, and as I said, this is a special case of the more general fact that I was telling you that uh, that these uh, that the on shell word identities that are the uh, that from this language are just the way of enforcing that we have a real Lorentz invariance for the scattering of these particles force you into the structures that we know and love of Yang Mills and uh, general covariance and so on at the level of the underlying Lagrangians. But the Weinberg soft theorems are a sort of a quick way of seeing this in a certain limit. Um, and if we go one step further and try to do this with a particle of spin three, okay. So some mu nu gamma, okay? So then we would write down some epsilon mu nu gamma, pj mu, pj nu, pj gamma, and then we get it over two pj dot q. Well, by the same logic and some coupling kappa j, by the same logic, we'd have to have that the sum over j of kappa j, pj mu, pj nu is equal to zero. And now this is just impossible. There's nothing I can do. This is now a quadratic constraint on the uh, momenta and it's just impossible, okay? I can't, uh, there's no choice I can make for the kappa j's that, does not, uh, that doesn't put so many constraints on the external data that, uh, that the amplitude would just have to vanish. So from these amazingly simple arguments uh, and what I hope you saw is that we just began with Lorentz invariance and, and, uh, and just the, just the uh, and quantum mechanics, just at the level of unitary representations of the uh, Poincaré group, we see this dramatic difference between massless and massive. 
And when we describe physics with our standard formalism of polarization vectors and so on, this forces us into gauge redundancy. And it has these dramatic consequences that mass of spin one has to have a gauge structure. Mass of spin two has to have a, a general equivariant structure and you can't have mass of spin three and, uh, and uh, above. Okay, so um, that's, uh, I will, um, uh, so someone asked for uh, references. Yes, uh, this business about the Weinberg soft theorem is also very nicely explained in uh, Weinberg's, uh, I believe volume one uh, field theory book. Um, so uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's the best discussion of it that I, uh, I, uh, uh, that I know of. Okay, so uh, maybe I will uh, stop here. Uh, again, the, so uh, what I hope you got from this lecture in, in, in a much more maybe direct uh, way than what we usually see with the books where we go through a sort of roundabout process of thinking about a Lagrangian and we like gate symmetry because it's pretty but it makes the path on the girl divergent, so we gauge fix, et cetera, et cetera. And then right very, very late in the day, we come to thinking about the actual connection to the direct particles. What I hope you see is how absolutely direct the connection is between these deep facts about the way the world in, in, in the wind that we look, that we see when we look outside the window, um, how the properties of that world sort of uh, gross properties follow very directly from the, from the deep principles that, that, that we uh, 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 know about. Uh, as I said, what I showed you in this lecture, in the second lecture, is uh, the, 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 the sort of best way of showing it in the usual formalism. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an even deeper and more transparent way, of, uh, a more powerful way of seeing it in an alternate formalism where you never see these polarization vectors to begin with. And um, I will think a little today whether I'll come back and actually describe this tomorrow or move on to uh, uh, other things because I don't have... I'm going, as usual, more slowly than I thought I would, but uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very nice, uh, uh, Nima. Maybe we can take a few questions, if you don't mind. There's one from uh, Fabio. Thank you for your patience.